Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody at home. Anybody here for the first time tonight? Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to anybody joining us on the Zoom machine first time. In service of uh, against the stream being a place where you have the potential of making some community, some connections, meeting some people, uh, I like to start by having you talk to each other. Uh, one of the problems, I think, dilemmas of Buddhist meditation groups um, is that there's a, a, a core teaching in Buddhism which says uh, take refuge in other people and in relationships with wise people, with people who are trying to practice this path. Um, but then uh, going to a meditation group seems like the best place to potentially meet other Buddhists, other meditators, but often you just meditate and then you leave and you never meet anybody because, so I, I try to break that um, by having you talk to each other. Uh, the topic tonight is um, this little book that my teacher Ajahn Amaro recently published. I think it's his, he's always publishing books. I think it's his newest one. Uh, in their passing is peace and it's about death it's about impermanence and even just like for for a moment reflecting on that statement in their passing there is peace um and you know partially i chose this because i just got this from him on this last retreat i was with him um uh, because dennis's partner just passed away my sister just passed away uh, maybe other people have death. Uh, maybe you know somebody who's died. I mean, everybody knows somebody who's died. Uh, and it's a core part of the Buddhist teaching to turn towards the truth of impermanence, the truth of uh, death. And um, so for the small group, I want you to discuss, I'll give you the full context. This is the thing that the monks say, it comes from the Buddha, and it's the things that the monks say if they're uh, performing funerals. Uh, these uh, four lines. They chant it in Pali, and the translation is, all conditions are impermanent and unstable. Having arisen, they decay. Having integrated, they disintegrate. Having begun, they end. Having come to a conclusion and cease. And in their passing is peace, contentment, and happiness. And so we're going to, um, I'm going to actually probably read you know directly from this uh, text and maybe do some commentary in the talk after the meditation but for the discussion uh how does this land with you and you know the, the beginning part of this book is like yes usually uh the grief that we feel in their passing doesn't feel peaceful it feels tragic and devastating and it doesn't feel like oh i'm so glad they're dead I'm so, you know, content and happy. It feels like, oh, no, I miss them and I feel sorrow and, and uh, you know, tragic often, depending on how old they are and how they die and all of that stuff. But even sometimes when grandma dies, you know, grandma was 99 and she died and I'm heartbroken because I'm going to miss her. But like, you're, there's also that part of you that like, of course, she died. She was 90 something or 80 something or whatever it was. So that's the topic. Small groups in their passing is peace. Does that make sense? We're going to talk about it after. Talk to each other for a little bit about it. And I'll put you guys in breakout rooms. Just choose two or three people in the room. Better that you don't know them so that you meet some new people. Okay, welcome back. Since we are um, going to look at this text on some of the Buddha's teachings on death and how to relate to impermanence, it could lend itself to doing one of the Buddhist practices around reflections on death, the body as impermanent and the stages of the corpse and decay, which is a, a classic uh, and important instruction. But I think that rather than um, doing that tonight, we'll just do mindfulness. With And I'll give you a little bit of encouragement from the beginning. Um, in mindfulness, we're looking for three things where mindfulness is present time awareness. What's happening right now? 
and we there's four levels what's happening in the body is the breath coming or going what sensations are present what feeling tones are present what's being perceived what's being experienced as pleasant or unpleasant or neutral uh, what's happening in the heart and mind what sort of mental activity emotions um, plans memories hope fear uh, craving, aversion, judgment, kind of being mindful of the mind. And this is really important, especially for anybody new to this form of meditation. A lot of people bring a, a, a bias to meditation that thinks that meditation is just turning your mind off or ignoring your mind or having uh, an, a tranquil, uh, still inner experience. The, the Buddha's instructions are pay attention to what's happening. And if stillness happens, cool. But if that's not what's happening, if thoughts are what's happening, use the thoughts as your practice, as part of your mindfulness, observing, being aware of what your heart, what your mind are uh, producing. And then the fourth uh, level is um, more of a um, kind of macro, what is the experience? Is there suffering? Be mindful of that. Is, is there craving? Be mindful of that. If the uh, five hindrances are happening, if the seven factors of there's all, I don't want to get into it, but more of a kind of awareness of, of what's the truth of your experience. So with those four levels, the encouragement is to investigate the three characteristics in all of those levels in the body and the heart and the mind. The characteristic of impermanence is the first one. And so that's the topic tonight really is impermanence. In, in the passing, there is peace. In their passing um impermanence and then um because of impermanence the unreliable unsatisfactory nature of whatever you're thinking feeling experiencing it's going to pass so you can't rely on it it's not worth clinging to no matter how sometimes you have these meditations that are so pleasant and you're sitting here and you're like i got it <laughs> and i want to keep it <laughs> and that remember you know reminder of like you can't keep it it's just a, a, an experience that's passing through it's it's un, unsatisfactory in itself and then the the third characteristic which we don't need to go into tonight although i believe the text might go into it some um which is that uh there's not a uh, it's not personal there's not a self that self-centered i me mine that the mind creates is not uh, trustworthy and it's sort of illusory that's that the way that we take everything personal and we believe our minds all of the time those are the three characteristics, impersonal, unsatisfactory, impermanent. In the meditation tonight, I encourage you to put most of the investigation on the impermanent nature of whatever is happening. Uh, it's arising and it's passing. And so we do that with the breath. The breath comes in and then it goes out. It comes in and then it goes out. Every breath impermanent and there's an end. There's a beginning, a middle, an end. It's in, there's a, an ending. Uh, every thought that arises, if you're paying attention <clears throat> to what your mind is doing, that thought comes, there's a memory that comes, and then it ends. Uh, there's a beginning, a middle, uh, that story that the mind is telling, and then it passes. That thought is gone. Sometimes thoughts can be quite repetitive. <laughs> like I'm thinking about this shit over and over and over, but it does have an over before it re-spins out in your mind. And I'll try to give some in the guided meditation, but mindfulness practice with a focus and an investigation on the ending of things, on the out breath, on the ending of thoughts, on how things dissolve, on uh, how did that text, uh, the traditional language of the text, which is having arisen, they decay, having integrated, they disintegrate, having begun, they end, they come to a conclusion and cease. And so this is about our bodies, but it's also about every single moment, every thought, every sensation, every emotion. It comes into being, it will cease being. If your body is born, it will cease living. It's the, the truth of impermanence. So finding a way to sit that feels upright, relaxed, sustainable, comfortable to begin with, finding that balance of uh, the upright spine that's not rigid, the body that's alert but not tense, and allowing our eyes to be closed 
in order to bring full awareness inward into the body. Take a moment to soften any unnecessary tension. Releasing tension in the face, the jaw, the shoulders, the chest, the belly. As you exhale, softening. kind of investigation, contemplation, mindfulness meditation seems to work best when we approach the practice with an attitude of kindness. The intention to be accepting and patient, friendly towards our own experience, towards the mind, the body, the heart. We bring awareness into the present, the sense doors of hearing and seeing, smelling and tasting are all providing information, phenomena, the sounds, the sights, the smells, tastes. The body, the nervous system, the sensations from head to toe, this living, breathing, feeling, form. In some ways, mindfulness is the investigation into the question, what's happening right now? What am I feeling? For the first few minutes, choosing to ignore the mind, let the thoughts be in the background, focusing the attention in the body with the sensations that the breath creates. With extra attention on the exhale, the end, the impermanent exhale. Each time the body breathes in, it's guaranteed to breathe out. But the next in-breath is not guaranteed. Even if we die right now while we're breathing in, the body will still exhale when air has been taken in. But it will not inhale again. So we can treat the exhale as the end of the breath.
when the attention is drawn away from the breath as is normal, natural, bring awareness to where it's gone to, usually back into thinking about something. You may turn towards that thought and see how it arises and passes, comes into being, eventually is replaced by another thought ending. For now, continuing to choose to disengage from the contents of the mind, return to the sensation and the process of the breath, simple focus. Feeling the texture, the temperature, the duration, the impermanence of each breath.
If you're new to the practice, just keep coming back to the breath. Keep ignoring the mind, keep investigating the impermanent nature of the breath coming and going. If your body becomes uncomfortable from sitting still, you can bring your attention to the discomfort, investigate it. Where's the tension? Where's the pain? Where's the middle of that sensation? Where, where does that sensation end? Where's the edges of it? Where does it dissolve? You can begin to open to the mind states rather than ignoring the mind if you care to. Observe how the thoughts arise and pass. Beginning, middle, end. The appearing of a plan or a memory, the sustaining, and then the passing, the dissolving.
I don't know if I'll get through this. It's a short book, but I'd like to get through the whole thing, so I might have to jump ahead a little bit. He starts, uh, again, the, the title is, And In Their Passing is Peace. The last Dharma talk that Lungpur Cha gave that was recorded, I believe, in our collection of his teachings is a Dhamma talk entitled, entitled, Why Are We Here? It was a talk he gave at Tom Sang Pet Monastery during the last rains retreat when his health was still good back in the early 80s. He spoke about this quality of ending, of disillu disillusion and decay. Kaya Vayam, Vayam in Pali. And it is interesting how in that very talk, he spoke about his own body, his own health as an example. Uh, Ajahn Lungpur Cha, who he's referring to, is the um, head of this lineage that is my, my teacher's teacher. And uh, he died in the um, late 80s, I believe, early 90s, late, late 80s, I think. Um, so this is my teacher, Ajahn Cha, or Ajahn Amaro, referring to his teacher, Ajahn Cha. Context. He said, everything is winding down and pretty soon my voice will be gone and you won't hear from me anymore. My voice is just about had it. My breath is just about gone. This turned out to be the case. He had some kind of stroke soon after leading to paralysis and the inability to speak within a year or so. He compared our life, the living process, to a block of ice melting in the sun. It is the nature to dissolve and to decay. I feel that it is a good time to reflect upon this, the nature of endings during these last days of the year. This uh, um, talk was originally given uh, at the end of a rains retreat, the end of the year. I think it was from... Um, Oh, it was uh, just before New Year's, the 29th of December, 2020. During these last days of the year, things are closing and finishing, including our activities for this year. We are getting closed up for our winter retreat due to begin January the 3rd. In the teaching of Lungpur Cha, he often reflected on di the disillusion and decay. He pointed out that even though there is a natural sense of sadness that accompanies the aging, cracking, and decaying of things, even just as the sound of the words decay and death themselves bring a somber, depressing feeling with them as they land in our ears and in our hearts. There is a chilling, cooling, a sadness that comes with that. However, Lung Por Cha would often point out how it is ironically the reflections on anicca, impermanence, the development of the perception of change and uncertainty that are also the gateway to wisdom. The understanding of the nature of change and uncertainty is the very heart of the development of wisdom. Another teaching of Lung Por Cha's on this same theme is called Our Real Home. It was given to an elderly lay disciple as she lay dying in her house in the village. In it, he refers to the reverse that we, the verse that we recite and reflect upon at the death of somebody, as well as at their funeral. All conditions are impermanent, are unstable. Having arisen, they decay. Having integrated, they disintegrate. Having begun, they end. They come to a conclusion, they cease. And in their passing is peace, contentment, happiness. The last line contains the aspect of these reflections that makes all the difference. So this is important to reflect upon. From a worldly perspective, when we experience the ending of things, particularly the loss of those that are dear to us, it is frightening, off-putting, it is something that we hate, we fear, such as the death of someone close to us, a monastic friend disrobing, leaving the community, the loss of your reputation in a lawsuit, 
your faculties decaying and not being able to see or hear clearly, not being able to remember, losing your mobi mobility or a broken friendship. Something turns a relationship sour and someone who is dear to you that you got on well with, that friendship is broken, ended. On a worldly level, these are all things that we are afraid of or that we experience a sense of aversion towards. This is almost a universal human reaction to impermanence. The sense of change, particularly with respect to things that we think of as ourselves or things that, we, that are dear to us, the people and objects that we feel we own, the aspects of our lives that we cherish. When those are challenged, we feel tense and afraid. We don't want to go, we don't want to lose. We don't want to be separated from that which we love. This is a powerful instinct, particularly in instance of a parent losing a child. It is natural to feel an extraordinary depth of anguish and painfulness. I remember my mother telling me how when her oldest brother, my uncle George, was killed in a bombing raid on London during the Second World War, my grandmother was inconsolable, howling with grief for days. She couldn't be comforted, comforted. It was a terrible, wrenching heartbreak. In that anguish, she was not alone. That is how it has been in our human family for hundreds of thousands of years. In particular, parents losing their children or for the children when beloved mothers and fathers pass away. It can be the same. There is an awful sense of loss, grief, and sadness. This is completely natural. So why would the Buddha say, in the passing of things, there is peace? It depends on the perspective. I would say, on what we take to be solid and real, on what we take to be the framework of our life. The key issue is whether we live life from a self-centered perspective or a nature-centered, a dharma-centered perspective. When using the term self-centered in a Buddhist sense, it doesn't necessarily mean being selfish. We use the word as we use the word in English. You can be extremely unselfish and yet still be relating to the people around you, your family, your possessions, your livelihood, your work, with a profound sense of self as a basis. Can you see the difference? I think this is a really key, because I use self-centered a lot. Uh, and it not, and I'm, I'm using it in this context, not necessarily that you're selfish, because you know, there can be the most selfless, generous person, but that's still uh, coming from the place of I and me and mine, not with greed, not with selfishness, but just with uh, self-identification. Uh, I, me, mine, my family. <laughs> I'm going to give to my family, uh, but that ownership, that clinging. For example, a mother might be extremely unselfish, generous, and kind, never thinking of herself, profoundly loving, yet could be deeply attached to her children and identified with the role of a mother. From a Buddhist viewpoint, this is still a self-centered perspective, a worldly perspective. I'm not criticizing that. It is a very natural and wholesome part of our human condition. However, as the Buddha pointed out over and over again, as long as the mind relates to his experience of the body and the mind and the people in the world around us from a position of self-view, Sakaya Diti, then that will necessarily be creating the causes and conditions for suffering. Does that make sense? As long as we're coming from a place of, it's all personal, self-view, it will create the causes and conditions for suffering. As long as we take the five khandas, the body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and discriminative consciousness, or consciousness, the mind, as absolutely real, as the entirety of who and what we are, then right there, we are creating the conditions for a lot of suffering. I would say that suggestion, that reflection of the Buddha, 
that the passing of things can bring happiness and peace, that pertains when the view, the perspective is changed. This is what results when the view goes from self view to right view. That is to say, seeing things in accordance with the Dhamma, in accordance with nature, understanding the impermanent nature. Another thing, another of Lung Por Chao's talks where he explores the theme of Anicca, uh, impermanence, is entitled Dhamma Nature. He gave this when one of the Western monks from Wat Pananachat had recently disrobed. That means you've been a monastic and then you're quitting. You're, you're disrobed, you're not, you're not getting naked. You're taking off your monk's robes and you're leaving the, the monastic life. And it's one of the major uh, experiences of loss that the monastics have because their community, they're so connected. They live together for years, sometimes decades. And then when somebody says, I'm not going to be a monk anymore, there's a big loss in that connection, leaving the community. It had been quite a disruptive, challenging event in the life of the community as he was a fairly senior monk and he had been a good friend, a companion of the new abbot at Wat Pananachat, Ajahn Pabakaro. Lungpur had come over to Wat Pananachat and was giving a teaching to the community of Western monastics. To me, this is one of the most profound and wonderful Dhamma talks among the many teachings of Lungpur Cha. Even though it was occasioned by a sad event in the community, with their natural sense of loss and the feelings of disappointment at the ending of someone's monastic life, the departure of a dear friend. It created the opportunity for an extraordinarily profound teaching on uncertainty and change and how to transcend that. In this Dhamma talk of Lung Por Chas, he pointed out how we need to look at the world around us to see how this life works. The example he used is of a tree with flowers growing on. He described how it can be that a flower on the tree starts to bud, then it gets knocked off by a bird or by the wind. Or it can be the flower is formed, but then it gets broken. It doesn't get pollinated. So even though there is a flower, it doesn't become a cause for fruition. Or it can be it gets fertilized and the flower turns into a fruit, but even as a young fruit, it gets knocked off the tree by wind, a passing squirrel or a bird. Something destroys it and damages it. It can be that the fruit is half formed, then it falls from the tree before it's fully ripe. Finally, some fruit stays on the tree and are able to abide there until they're fully ripe. And then they fall from the tree when they have reached their complete natural potential. They are ripe before they fall, he explained, how it is exactly the same in our human lives. Some people die in the womb. Some people die just after birth. Some people die when they are quite young. Some people die in their middle years, and some people will live until they are <clears throat> very old and die in their later years. That's how nature is. It's not personal. That is the natural order. Then he extended this to the monastic life and how long different people stay in robes. The challenge of practicing the Dhamma for us as monastics and the lay community gathered here, those who are listening to this teaching, watching it as a re recorded, reading this as a book, listening to Noah read it as a book. The challenge is in recognizing and acknowledging the habits of worldly thinking, the habits of self-view and the ignorant, deluded, partial, biased way of thinking, and then training the heart to see things in terms of nature rather than in terms of self. The more that shift of view occurs, then the more the heart is open to all the uncertainty, changes, and loss. And because of this, it doesn't hold those changes in our world, in our life, in the people around us, in the habitual, conditioned, worldly way. Instead, the mind creates, the mind ceases to create the causes for the anguish of loss. This is the case whether it's the loss of our faculties, our ability to hear or see and think and move and so forth, 
or if it's in our relationships, the work that we do, the place where we live, the, the buildings we occupy, the people that are near and dear to us. The heart radically changes the way it frames those experiences, those contacts, our friendships. We are transforming the way we relate, particularly to other beings. Habits of appreciation and love based on self-view are what I call a possessive love. This self-based kind of loving is known as uh, pia or paya in Pali, which literally means dear. To relate with that quality of dearness and possessiveness is easy and natural for us human beings. But within it, we are unconsciously planting the seeds of dukkha, of suffering, right? holding dear. When the heart is freed from self-view, there is a transformation in the way that appreciation, affiliation, and closeness to others is held and experienced. The caring for others, the feeling, a sense of appreciation, gratitude, and love for others forms through what we are calling the sublime abiding, the four Brahma Viharas, Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upeka, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity or serenity. When the heart sees things with the eye of Dhamma, when it sees from a Dhamma-centered perspective, then the emotions that we experience and the relationships that we have with each other are based on those qualities of metta, karuna, mudita, upeka. This is what I call liberative love. The kind of love that liberates rather than the one that confines or binds or limits us. In themselves, metta, karuna, mudita, upeka do not create the cause of suffering. They do not create anguish as in an after effect contrary to the way that possessive love does. When we look at the way most of us habitually view life, we find that what we are looking for as human beings is birth without death. Death and loss, these qualities are seen as an enemy as a problem. Many myths and legends, classic stories, many human endeavors have been built around trying to conquer death, attempting to live forever, trying to sustain this life permanently. Maybe nobody here at Amaravati have had this particular idea that I would like to live forever, or perhaps they have. After all, Amaravati is the name of the monastery that he's at, that he's teaching from. Amaravati means the deathless realm. That aside, if we look at the human world in so many different societies around the world, there is fear of death. Death is seen as the enemy. We want to conquer death as it is regarded as bad and wrong, and it is an unwelcome intruder. I feel that one of the benefit, beneficial aspects of developing the uh, perception of impermanence is that we see more and more clearly that the idea of birth without death is impossible. It is an absurdity. If there is birth, there is necessarily a death. Lungpur Samedo would often say when I lived here with him in the late 1980s and 90s, when people asked him about dealing with their own impending death because they'd been given a terminal diagnosis or someone close to them was dying or had died, Lungpur Sameda would say, the cause of death is birth. It is not having heart disease or cancer or kidney failure. It's birth. Over and over again, he would say that with a caring and loving attitude in a way that was designed to be helpful to people, respecting their condition, but expanding the view of what was happening. Pretty much every time he said that, there would be a moment where the person would realize Oh, yes, that's right. Invariably, the attention would have previously been focused on the car accident that caused the damage, the heart disease that my husband had, or my mother had cancer, and that's the thing that killed her. The mind would focus upon what had been the catalyst of the ending of their lives, naming that as the cause of death. However, when Lung Por would say that it's really birth that is the cause of death, in that very moment, for most people, there is a shift of view. Oh, of course, that's how it has to be. You can't have birth without death. Everything that begins has to end. 
That's the way nature operates <clears throat> in this worldly plane, on the condition plane, that it is a necessary part of it. <clears throat> Even though it doesn't make sense logically, the idea of having a beginning and no ending, in spite of the fact that nothing we look at in the natural world operates that way, somehow we feel that there must be a way that I can have birth without death, without this thing ever failing, or this unwelcome intrusion, this thing that shouldn't be. In short, how can I conquer death so that I will always be me? So much of our mythology and stories in the human family in many cultures revolve around these ideas of conquering death. Yet see, <clears throat> yet sees the only issue, sees the issue in only in limited and worldly terms. Accordingly, I feel it's important to see that death is a natural part of life. That said, I'm not promoting murder or suicide in any way, shape, or form. That's all. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. Rather, it is to see the natural truth that, as Lung Por Sumedho put it, the cause of death is birth. These processes are intrinsically interrelated. As we look at the living world and how living systems operate, we can see that death is, in fact, a necessary part of life. A good example is our own bodies. When you study biology or physiology, you learn that your body needs to have certain cells dying off. Some serious illnesses can be caused by cells in our bodies living too long. Many cells have an off switch. That is, <clears throat> they come into being, they grow until they are fully formed, they do their job for a certain amount of time, and then they are pro programmed to switch off and to die. The medical name for this process is apoptosis. Ap I don't know, apoptosis, um, or programmed cell death. They have done their bit. They have fulfilled their function. Then they activate their programmed off switch. They need that. We need that. There are illnesses that we can get, such as some autoimmune disorders and various types of cancer that are caused particular cells not switching off and dying. The whole system is damaged by that. I therefore feel it's important to appreciate impermanence and to learn how not to be afraid of death, to see that the ending of things is an intrinsic, natural, and important part of this living process. Indeed, it is also worthy of note that there are some living systems that when cells die, they actually make use of the dead cells, which then become an important part of the living system. Our fingernails or toenails are not actually alive. There is certainly no blood supply or nerves in them. And it's really handy that we can't feel anything through our fingernails. They are useful because the keratin that fingernails are made from can't feel anything. It's insensitive. So we can use it to scratch with, to dig things out with, and to use as hard objects. One of the aspects of the living world that I've been fascinated with for some time are what are called, I'm going to skip this part. He goes on about slime molds. You know what a slime mold is? He's fascinated with slime molds. <laughs> There are many processes like this in the natural world where the death of one part is useful, indeed necessary for the whole living organism to survive. Another example, I think I'm gonna skip this too. Another example, which is even more extraordinary than the slime mold <laughs> is that of a particular kind of caterpillar. Okay, we'll go with the caterpillar. Some of you might have come across this when looking at nature books. As this caterpillar grows, the hard, What's it called? Carapace? Carcipus? Car no, I don't know. The skeleton. Car carapace. Carapace. Uh, the exoskeleton of its head gets too small. It then sheds that shell, and this allows the head to grow a bit bigger. However, this particular kind of caterpillar, when it sheds this exoskeleton, this kind of chitinous skull, it doesn't throw it away. It keeps it, and it wears it like a hat. The nickname for this particular creature is the, is the Mad Hatterpillar. 
partly because as it grows, it collects these skull shells. So it ends up with a stack of these heads on top of one another. And you can see photographs of these wonderful pieces of headgear in nature books and on the web. In case you are interested, the Latin name for it is Uraba lugens. It's found in Australia, a country where there are many such wonderful and extraordinary creatures. He's, you know, he's, he's going off. It piles these formal skulls on top of each other, almost like a Dr. Seuss invention. Not the cat in the hat, but the caterpillar in the hat. It ends up with three or four or five of these former heads all stacked on top of each other. The purpose of this piling up process seems to be that they not only wear it as a form of decoration, but they also use it as a defense mechanism. If the caterpillar gets attacked by a predator, it can use the hat stack as a club to knock the predator away. So these dead parts of its bodies, these cells that had fulfilled their original purpose, it keeps them and they serve as protection as well as adornment. This is part of its life, its unique characteristics. That was a small digression into biological curiosities. By the way of giving some examples, as I do feel that this is an extremely important area for us to reflect upon, to consider how death is an intrinsic and necessary part of life. In speaking like this, however, it's important to understand that death here does not refer to the demise of the whole body or the parts of the body, like our fingernails or the coatings of our teeth that are insensitive or to the fruit fruiting body of a slime mold or to the extra heads of the mad hatter pillar. In addition, and significantly, it also, it's also the many and various ego deaths, the painful losses in our lives where we've said something stupid or we've caused upset in somebody else, where we lost something that was precious to us, where we've had to project that we launched or that a bright idea that people responded to with, I don't like that, not a good idea, let's not do that. Or you followed some project through and it was expensive and it was an expensive failure, the feeling of being criticized, the feeling I got it wrong, people don't like me. How could I have done that? That was so stupid of me to say that, I really spoiled that friendship. I meant well, but she misunderstood, now things have, gone really sour between us and so on. With respect to those kinds of ego death, we recognize in exactly the same way that we don't have to look at them as bad or wrong or unwarranted, unwelcome intrusions. Rather on an ordinary everyday level, it is maybe even more important to be welcoming of those kinds of death as a natural part of our living system. They don't have to be seen as bad or wrong or as something that shouldn't be. If we look at the idea that we'd like to have birth without death, have success with no failure, receive praise with no criticism, have gain and no loss, have comfort and no discomfort, we will realize that that's not the way nature works. The more we can open the heart to the truth and see things with the eye of Dhamma, see things from the base of Samaditi, basis of Samaditi. What Samaditi mean, Jesse? You know? Wisdom. From the basis, I don't know what this poly, I forget what this poly word means. Yeah, that changes the quality of our experience of the world. It radically changes the way we relate to our body, our life, our mind, our relationships, the work we do, the places we live, and our interactions with the world around us. It changes all that in a profound and complete way, a fundamental way. This is an extraordinarily helpful area to look at because death, loss, pain, and so, far, and so forth are naturally off-putting. We recoil. We don't even like to hear the sound of the word death. If it is announced that this is going to be a Dhamma talk about loss and pain and death and grief, we can easily feel, oh dear, not one of those. Even at the mere sound of the words, loss, pain, death, grief, something inside us quails, it shuts down. It doesn't want to hear it. However, 
the encouragement of the Buddha is to recognize instead that in the passing of things, there is peace. At the ending of things, there is sukha, happiness. There is contentment. There is peace. When we speak of the ending, the passing of things, it's also important to understand that that, that ending happens in two distinct ways, a worldly way and a transcendent way. Firstly, when a condition, a thing comes to its end in time, the end of an outbreath, the end of a book, the end of a relationship, the end of a life. This means the absence of a thing that had been present. When understood in terms of nature and not self, that absence is peaceful. The second type of ending is to do with a change of view. It is seeing of the empty, transparent nature of things, even while it is still present. It is a passing of the thingness, the apparent solidity of an object an experience or an event. For example, even as the flow of the breath is perceived, it is known as an empty sensation. The book we are reading is known as void of intrinsic substance. That is just a collection of elements and conditioned conventions of symbol and language. The life we are experiencing as conventionally ours is realized to be a set of habitual identifications based on assumptions about time, location, identity, and habits that are seen to be impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. This kind of ending, passing, is based on the transparency rather than the absence of a condition. But when it is realized, it is equally, if not more, peaceful. You understand this distinction? The physical ending versus the ending of a, a, a misperception. Wisdom leading to the ending of, of seeing uh, something as solid, which is not actually solid. Um, um, you know, the, the misperception, that tendency to think I am permanent and then seeing like, oh, I'm not permanent and I don't need to be so self-centered. I don't have to cling to it. Wise view, when you have that wise view, that wisdom perspective. In terms of practice, we're almost there. We can do this, maybe. In terms of practicing Dhamma, it is thus essential to notice that recoiling reflex, that feeling of wrongness and badness around both physical death and ego death, all of these different kinds of social deaths. We need to get acquainted with that and to train the heart not to be intimidated by that. When we feel we've done something wrong or that things are out of order, things shouldn't be this way. We need to turn the attention on that, to open the heart, to look at the feeling of wrongness, of disappointment, of betrayal, of loss, and being diminished. When the eye of Dhamma is applied in this way, there is a seeing of the Dhamma perspective when it is realized that the cause of death is birth we will find at least for a moment a change of view. There is a recognition, oh yes, of course. That arises as the instant of clear vision. When those moments arise, when that clarity is present, allow that to be fully appreciated. Allow that to be fully known. This is how we develop. We practice the Dharma. We embody the Dharma. We develop the perspective of Dharma by recognizing that truth of the relatedness of birth and death and fully appreciating the peace, simplicity, and clarity that comes in those moments where there is the insight, oh yes, of course, how could it be otherwise? Why was I so upset? Why did I call this wrong or bad? If we let that be acknowledged, it then informs our attitude. It nourishes the ground and plants the seeds. It creates a basis for further development of right view, of wisdom. I realize I was saying that the idea of birth without death is an absurdity, it's ridiculous, but this place is called the deathless realm, Amravati, literally means the deathless realm. And my name, Amaro, means deathless. So how does that work? Again, I feel this is a useful area to reflect upon. When we talk about deathlessness, it is not the same as denying death. It is not the same as attaching to life and negating death which is absurd and is 
uh, pr uh, productive of suffering. The, the idea of birth without death, being me forever, living forever. So what do we mean by deathlessness, the deathless realm and so on? Sometimes people might hear the name Amaravati, the deathless realm, and look upon it as some kind of denial of death, a positive affirmation indicating a foolish idealism. If we bring the attention to this and look at the Buddha's teaching and the mythology of the Buddha's life, it points out directly how deathlessness is not a denial of death, but rather a transcendence of it. The difference between the two is that to deny, to deny death is to contend against it, to fight it, to suppress it, to make it into an enemy. To transcend death is to see it in a different way, to take a broader view, to see it as the nature of things in a more profound and complete way, to apprehend the dimension of reality where time, causality, birth and death, location, language and identity do not apply. For example, in the story of the Buddha's enlightenment, that we have in the scriptures and in the mythology of Buddhism, we have the accounts of the Bodhisattva sitting under the Bodhi tree and making the resolution, may my bones turn to dust, may my blood dry up, but I will not move from this spot until full and complete enlightenment has been realized. The effect of the Bodhisattva sitting down with that resolution then caused the coming forth of Mara and the forces. Mara literally means death. Right there in the name is indication that this is the embodiment of death. When Mara and his forces came to challenge the Bodhisattva under the Bodhi tree, he didn't fight with Mara. It is sometimes called the battle with Mara, but I feel it's a misnomer. It is a wrong way of describing the encounter because the Bodhisattva was sitting, he wasn't fighting. Mara was conquered, but it was not a contention. If you see the difference between those two ideas, one of the Buddha's epitaphs is Jinna, the conqueror. However, the conquest that defeat of Mara ironically was actualized through non-contention. The dispelling of the influence of death was affected through understanding, through wisdom. It is often says in the scriptures, not just in the stories of the Buddha's enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, but at other times, Mara comes along to try and fool the Buddha, to delude the Buddha, or to tempt or threaten him. Then the Buddha's response is always along the lines of, I know you, evil one. I know who you are. I know what this is. I see you, Mara. I know Mara, O cousin of the negligent. This story is part of the Buddhist mythology, and I feel it carries an important message. Rather than death being an enemy or something that needs to be fought against or destroyed, instead, Mara was disempowered by the Buddha's understanding of what Mara is, what death is. Through that understanding of the newly enlightened Buddha, Mara becomes powerless to have any influence to harm or to tempt or to challenge him. Through the awakened understanding that arose in the heart of the Buddha at his enlightenment, Mara was rendered harmless to him. At first, Mara refused to acknowledge this powerlessness and tried to assert his right to claim rulership over the universe. This assertion caused the earth goddess Dharani to rise up to be the witness for the validity of the Buddha's spiritual pre preeminence. And Mara and his entire army was swept away in a wild torrent of water that sprang from the hair of the goddess. These are symbolic stories, and I feel that they bear a significant meaning in our practice. The non-identification with the five khandhas comes with the true appreciation of impermanence, with the understanding of birth and death, beginnings and endings, how impermanence is pervasive throughout the natural order, both physical and mental. In Vipassana meditation, insight meditation, we actively use that appreciation of the quality of change, uncertainty. We reflect that every aspect of the experiential world, what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste, what we touch, what we think and feel is in a state of change, is impermanent. 
The reflection on dukkha, suffering, is that very aspect of the experiential field is incapable of satisfying completely and permanently. All things are dukkha. All things are necessarily unsatisfactory. They can't please or complete in a permanent way. They are dukkha. They are unsatisfactory. Lastly, all things are anatta. They are not self. They are not who or what we are. They are not a self and they do not belong to a self. They are empty, void of self-existence. Okay, we're almost there. I'm going to skip to the end. We're going to jump ahead here. I'm going to, we're missing like 10 pages. I know, but I don't want to do this again next week. You, I can only read once in a while. Okay, let's see, last couple pages. The Buddha's engagement with the world was based on both wisdom and compassion. The story goes that shortly after the enlightenment, it was the Brahma Sahapati that came to the Buddha and said, please, out of compassion for those with only a little dust in their eyes, please share your understanding. The effect of that realization of the Buddha, that radical letting go where the bridge between awakened awareness and the five khandas was, cut off the root, made like a palm tree stump, deprived of the conditions for existence and rendered incapable of arising in the future. There was no longer any identification, no grasping, no attachment, but total attunement. The effect of that radical letting go of the world was ironically and extraordinarily attunement to the five khandhas. The total attunement based on wisdom and compassion was informed by the motivation to do what could be done with the conditions of the world, with the things that could be said and structures that could be set up like the Sangha, the monastic community, the Dhamma teachings, in order to help other living beings realize the end of suffering. It's important to reflect that when we talk about the deathless, the unborn, the unconditioned, it is not a spaciness. It's not some sort of dissociation or something that serves the mind from the practical realities of the body and the living world of responsibilities. Things like the building committee meeting at the uh, Bhikkhu Samanera meeting and looking after the health of our bodies, not at all. Rather, the more completely the deathless is realized, the more that this life is able to be attuned to the born and the dying, to the living and the changing world. It's mysterious how that works, but that's how it functions. The result of that radical non-attachment, the bridge of identification is down, that bridge is broken and gone. The identification with the body and personality and the living world, the grasping of it, the identification with it is gone. The result of that is an extraordinary, comprehensive, complete attunement and attitude of compassionate service. That's the effect of radical letting go. The result of letting go of the world is the compassionate motivation towards an attunement to the people and things around us. To sum this all up, you could say that the Buddha loved the world, so he let go of it completely and was thus able to be of the greatest benefit to it. These are thoughts. These thoughts are offered for your consideration. There was a core section there that there were some good teachings that I didn't get to. Um, this book, if you're, you know, want to study it a little bit, especially if you're going through some grief and have some questions about uh, death and, and this, this radical perspective that talks about uh, the, the peace and the happiness in, in the uh, accepting of impermanence and, and letting go. Um, these, all these books are always published for free and you can order them if you go to the Amaravati or probably here if you go to the Abhayagiri uh, website and you can see if they have it listed and then they send it to you for free. They, you can't buy these books. They're published by the monastery and they're for free distribution only, um, but you can send them a donation and they'll send you the book if you want to look at these teachings more personally. Hey, Noah, what's the title of it again? I didn't find it on the Abhayagiri site yet. In their passing is peace. Oh, you're going to post a link if it's on there. Yeah, I, I, I just got this like you know three weeks ago in Thailand, and I think it's a, a brand new print. So I don't know that it's uh, might not be up yet.
for your consideration, your contemplation. Thank you for bearing with me for the book reading tonight, story time. Thank you. Um, class is done by donation. Against the Stream is a nonprofit organization that is fully dependent upon and supported by the generosity of the people who attend and are participate. Uh, obviously, we don't charge anything. I've been doing this Monday night class for almost 20 years now, every single Monday night on the West Side. Uh, and so 20, you know, we're, we're still here 20 years into it, taking donations and uh, supporting this, the center and supporting me and we have one employee, our employee uh, is on vacation this week so I'm, I'm on my own tonight. Uh, Sebastian and his, his fiance are having a holiday I saw some pictures of them on the beach in Mexico today it was a little bit. Little, little jealous happy for them I mean. Yeah. <laughs> a little jealous. Um, so be as generous as you can be and support the community in whatever way feels appropriate to you. Suggestion is about $25 for a drop-in class, considering all of the other things that we spend $25 on these day, yoga classes, and even a movie sometimes you end up spending 25 bucks on. So, you know, putting uh, that kind of uh, financial support into something that's important and that's helping you transform uh, is a worthy, worthy thing to put some energy, some money into. We have a 10 day meditation retreat at the um, beginning. It starts right at the end of September, beginning of October. Um, 10 day silent sitting and walking meditation retreat. You're all invited. There's a handful of spots left. You're all invited, but only a handful of you can come. So um, if you're planning to do that, uh, look at the website, sign up for that, and, and join us for this meditation retreat. Judy? Can I just ask, is your death list still available? On that, we, yeah. that I could listen to. The band? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. Something on there that was very much like I think you can find that, yeah. Okay. You're referring to a um, Buddhist punk rock band that my friend started and I wrote some of the um, songs. I didn't, I'm not in the band, but I, I kind of, I co-founded the band and I wrote like most of the lyrics for the, at least the first record. And then he has me reading from against this a yeah. reading from the against the stream book with some punk rock in the background. Yeah, very cool. It's called the deathless. You probably could find it on SoundCloud or Spotify or yeah, something like that. May any goodness that comes from our practice be shared with each other and shared with anybody who's grieving. Uh, the talk tonight was inspired by uh, the passing of my sister, Tara Ananda Mandarava Levine, a few weeks ago, and anybody else who's uh, experiencing loss and the suffering that goes along with that, may each one of us get as free as possible, and together may we create a positive change on this planet. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome.